O kia ora tātou, katoa, a tūtahi e mihi ana, ki a koutou katoa, koutou kua hui huinga i tēnei rā, koutou kua tau mai ki te wā, te nā koutou, te nā koutou, kia ora mai anō koutou katoa. Warm Pacific greetings also to our whanaunga from the Pacific. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I've been asked to introduce, quite simply, uh, the next uh, session. It's a conversation between Jennifer Curtin and Jane Koronek of the OECD, and then we'll lead into the next panel discussion. Thank you. Kia ora, Jane. Um, I'm going to introduce you to our audience. So Jane Koronek is an economist here and trade policy analyst in the OECD. Um, the Organisation of Economic Cooperation and Development here in Paris. And Jane leads the OECD's work on inclusive trade and her recent policy research examines how trade impacts women and men differently and how trade policies can support women's economic empowerment. She's also engaged in research on the regulation of extractive industries, the circular economy, global value chains, services, regional trade agreements, trade costs, and trade finance. So an expert in all things trade. So thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. So to begin, inclusive trade, trade for all. It's become an important focus for trade and trade policy in Aotearoa New Zealand, as you know, over the past five years or more. Mm -hmm. But it's also a, a critical area of interest for the OECD. So can you walk us through when this topic became an issue for the OECD and why and how? Just sort of a broad overview. Sure. So um, the first paper that I wrote on trade and gender was actually in 2005. Um, but it was decided by the OECD Trade Committee at that point that we would not be um, pursuing work on that. So we actually started working on trade and gender in kind of as a, as an, um, uh, theme of our work in uh, 2020. Okay. And we started working on indigenous peoples and trade in 2022. So that is, you know, this biennium, we work on a two year biennium basis, our, mm -hmm. our work plan. And that is this biennium for the first time we're working on indigenous peoples and trade. We worked a little bit more widely on um, micro and small enterprises starting in about 2015 or 2016. And really, I think all of the, the question around inclusive trade has come through um, because there is a realization that the aggregate outcomes of trade are no longer what we need to be focusing on. We know the benefits of trade. We know that more trade uh, brings more growth. Mm -hmm. We know that more trade brings lower prices through, through uh, greater specialization. Um, it brings uh, a sharing of technological change, of new technologies, and it brings new networks. So the overall aggregate benefits of trade, I think are well understood. We at the OECD have been making that case for decades, mm -hmm. and they're fairly well understood. Mm -hmm. However, um, trade does not lift all boats. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it is important to better understand who the winners of lo and losers of a trade policy or a trade agreement will be. Are they uh, women? Are they small businesses? Uh, urban versus rural dwellers, um, men and women, indigenous communities, um, and better understanding the impacts of trade on different communities also means that we can better um, put into place uh, comp uh, complementary policies mm -hmm. in order to um, not increase inequality or um, bring certain gaps uh, that, that we are not looking for from a public policy perspective. Yeah. So given the role the OECD plays in generating research and promulgating knowledge and policy learning, how does your organisation differentiate between what counts as international relations 
and, and I know that you have expertise in the international economy, but also that domestic level of public policy. Yeah, so there's been quite a change in, in the trade space uh, in this area. Mm -hmm. So when we think back um, at the WTO, the WTO informal working group on micro, small and medium enterprises met for the first time in 2018. That now seems um, incredible that it wasn't before, right? Mm -hmm. And even today, it's an informal working group so it's not, you know, a fully mandated resourced committee. Um, the uh, WTO informal working group on trade and gender met for the first time in 2020. Okay. So that's only, you know, a few years ago. So um, the idea there is that um, we are bringing more issues into the trade space. And this has started um, some time ago with um, issues like trade and environment, mm -hmm. trade and labor, mm -hmm. and you know, now more recently, um, trade and, and gender, and even trade and indigenous peoples. There will be the first chapter on trade and indigenous peoples uh, in, a, in a trade agreement uh, coming out I, I think in, the, in the process of finalization. So um, as regards kind of specific provisions, say on gender, for mm -hmm. example, um, you know, it really depends how far countries want to go. If you look at some um, cooperation agreements or cooperation provisions within trade agreements, um, countries will be discussing elements of um, gender equality that are more focused at the domestic level, but those discussions will happen in the context of a trade agreement. So for example, um, cooperation provisions where countries discuss uh, things like the gender wage gap mm -hmm. and how to <clears throat> and how to um, uh, close gender wage gaps. Um, other countries will be pushing uh, further. We know in some um, aid for trade programs, they actually tackle tackle some aspects that are seemingly untrade related like violence against mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. um, so it really depends on the country level, I right. would say, on the countries involved and how far they want to go into the domestic policy space. Mm -hmm. But that's something that is changing and, and we're seeing more and more um, policy space within, um, within trade policy. Yeah, and, it, and it, it seems like that's a really important initiative just to, to enable those who are not experts in trade, understand that trade still matters for them, you mm -hmm. know, personally or as communities and so on. And I, I think we'll come back to that with our final question. So carrying on with this theme of gender and trade and the work of the OECD, when we think about gender analysis and advancing um, women and trade and business and SMEs and micro enterprises and so on, there's a whole, as you say, a whole bunch of other areas this means that within the OECD, gender and work on gender is going to be more of a horizontal issue across work streams, perhaps? So um, our work at OECD has been looking at, um, in the trade and gender space, we started by looking at um, or creating, developing a framework of analysis, mm -hmm. um, looking at the major impacts that, um, that uh, impact women and men differently, the major trade impacts that, uh, that, that affect men and women differently. And we applied that to our first um, pilot country review, which was of New Zealand, okay. trade and gender review of New Zealand. And we're now um, doing another uh, trade and gender review, which is of seven Latin American countries. Wow. So our uh, research in that area continues. But you're absolutely right. Um, Gender equality and gender gaps um, analysis undertaken in OECD is very much of a horizontal uh, activity. The OECD ambassadors uh, meet regularly to discuss the work on gender equality in a group mm -hmm. called the Friends of Gender Equality Plus. And so they discuss the work that is going on in a wide range of areas that touch on gender and gender equality. 
And so in our work, particularly on trade, we've worked in um, other folks who, we, we've worked uh, alongside other folks who, for example, specialize on, in uh, micro and small enterprises. Mm -hmm. So we did a whole, a whole um, paper on women in trade, women uh, business leaders of small and medium enterprises mm -hmm. in trade. Mm -hmm. And that came out in the, um, the OECD SME and Entrepreneurship Outlook publication that really is destined toward um, the SME community, the SME policymaker community. Um, we also work with many organizations outside OECD. With the WTO, we contributed a chapter on women in aid for trade, mm -hmm. aid for trade programs that have a, a gender focus. We did that with our colleagues working in the WTO Secretariat, and that was part of the, um, the Global Review, Aid for Trade Global Review. Um, and we present our work in many different fora, from APEC to the World Economic Forum, ILO, mm -hmm. and of course, in our member countries, including New Zealand. Yeah, very good. So you mentioned earlier that you've been hearing from Indigenous peoples about what inclusive trade might involve from their perspective. Can you talk a little bit more about where these initiatives are going, what's in train, what we can look out for in terms of sharing experiences cross-nationally? Maybe you could elaborate mm -hmm. on the initiatives that are happening out of here. Sure. Um, so so first thing, this... Um, this uh, Workstream has just started mm -hmm. at OECD, mm -hmm. and the OECD Trade Committee uh, agreed for the first time in its history um, to work on this specific workstream. So that is fairly historic, mm -hmm. and that was thanks to um, the support from particularly New Zealand, who brought along um, other member countries with them. Um, so we're really at the beginning, teasing out the implications uh, of trade. But this is an important um, aspect of our work because we know that indigenous peoples have trade in their DNA. Um, this, uh, they traded long before they came into contact with Europeans. We know this is the case um, in Mexico. There are, um, there's uh, much evidence of that in North America as well. Um, the importance of the canoe in indigenous communities for transportation, for livelihood, but also for trade. Mm. And um, so we're starting at the OECD by identifying um, future areas of future research. And we're doing that by discussions with uh, indigenous groups and with policymakers. Mm. So one area is just that, engagement of governments with indigenous groups. Um, we know that that is done in a certain way in, in New Zealand um, with uh, treaty partners. In um, Canada, that is, there are different groups mm -hmm. and different ways of engaging and, um, and consulting. Um, and elsewhere, it's done differently. Mm -hmm. So we want to discuss those different models of engagement mm -hmm. and um, bring those to OECD where there is a vast um, difference in experience. Mm -hmm. um, in New Zealand and Australia, there's a difference with, for example, countries in Latin America. Um, one of the areas that we want to look into is intellectual property and protection of traditional knowledge. Mm -hmm. This is a, a difficult area. Um, there is already a lot going on in the international space. And we know that there are concerns in this area um, on the part of indigenous peoples. So we want to um, bring those and, and discuss what those concerns are mm -hmm. and whether um, we can find um, uh, responses in that space. Another area that we want to look into is gaps that impede indigenous businesses from trading, mm -hmm. whether um, those are digital gaps, um, access to finance, skills gaps, access to business networks. And of course, we need more data. Data on indigenous people in labor markets, um, on uh, uh, indigenous peoples in leadership, and in trade. I just want to finish up by asking you where to from here. So 
given the OECD is about knowledge transfer and promulgation of good practices and so on, how do you think the work of communicating and demystifying trade and trade agreements and the benefits of trade, where does that need to go next in terms of bringing communities along with the bureaucrats and the negotiators and so on? So I, you know, one of the comparative advantages of OECD is evidence-based policy recommendation mm -hmm. and bringing that evidence out there. So we continue to do that. We'll continue to do that through our deep dives in um, trade and gender. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll continue to do that through our work on trade and indigenous peoples. Um, and communications has become a bigger and bigger part of what we do. Uh, our director is very media savvy, mm -hmm. and she has put a very strong emphasis on communications, as has our secretary general. Mm -hmm. So that will certainly continue. We have been asked by our member countries more and more for you know, one-page summaries. So they want all of the research, the very long research papers and all of the detail, but then they want a one-page summary mm -hmm. that um, is then something that is more easy, easy to communicate. And um, we've also, um, I think we're starting to understand the impact and the power of storytelling. Mm -hmm. And so um, I want to, in the future, in the inclusive trade agenda, integrate a whole storytelling aspect because um, you know women in trade, indigenous peoples in trade, they have stories to tell and those are interesting stories. Yeah. But this is not the way we have been communicating at OECD in the past. Mm. So this is something new for us. Yeah, new frontier. Mm. And I also understand that a lot of the resources that the OECD has currently in their library that's a sort of a pay-as-you-go type thing for the public are, are going to move to being open source yeah. next year sometime. So that's, right. that's exciting for researchers outside the OECD who want to do that translation work that you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jane, for talking with us today. It's been thank an you. Absolute My pleasure. pleasure. And um, look forward to hearing next year about how some of these um, initiatives are going. So thank you. And we look forward to welcoming you back in Aotearoa and New Zealand again soon. Would love to come back. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you very much, and a, and a special thanks to Jennifer, wherever she is. Um, the, we just watched the video, and it went well.